In the previous video, we looked at what neural networks are. And we discussed how to compute a forward pass. That is, given the input to the model, how do we produce the output, the model's prediction? And we ended on this question. How do we work out the gradient for such a complicated model? For neural networks, the gradients quickly get too complex to work out by hand, so we need to automate this process. There are three basic flavors of working out derivatives and gradients automatically. The first is to do it symbolically. This is basically what we do on pen and paper, and when we do so, this is a pretty mechanical process. It's not too difficult to program this process out and to let the computer do it for us. This, for instance, is what happens when you ask Wolfram Alpha to work out a derivative. This method has its uses, certainly, but it won't work for us here. The symbolic expression of the gradient of a function grows exponentially with the complexity of the original function. And that means that as we build bigger and bigger networks, the expression of the gradient would soon grow too big to store in memory, let alone to compute. An alternative approach is to forget the symbolic form of the function entirely and to just estimate the gradient for a specific input x. We could, for instance, pick some points close to x and fit a hyperplane through the outputs. This would be a pretty good approximation of the tangent hyperplane, so we could just work out the gradient from there. The problem is that this is a pretty unstable business. It's quite difficult to be sure that the answer is accurate. It's also expensive. The more dimensions in your model space, the more points you need to sample to get an accurate estimate of your gradient. And each point requires you to recompute the model for a new input. Backpropagation is a middle ground. It does part of the work symbolically and part of the work numerically. We get a very accurate computation of the gradient and the cost of computation is usually only twice as expensive as computing the output for one input. Here are the basic steps required to implement backpropagation for a given function. We break down our computation into a chain of modules. We work out the derivative of each module with respect to its input symbolically. And then we compute the global gradient for a given input by multiplying these different gradients. Finally, in order to do this effectively, we need to do it in the right order. That's what we'll look at in the next video. For now, we'll just look at a very basic example to see the difference between local and global gradients. Here is an arbitrary scalar function. There is no special meaning to this function. I just chained together a few operations for which the derivatives are simple to work out. First, we take our function f and we break it up into a chain of smaller functions. And the output of each of these functions feeds into the next. Defining the functions a, b, c, and d as shown here, we can write f as the result of applying x to a, taking that output of a and feeding it as an input to b, taking that output of b and feeding it as an input to c, and taking that output of c and feeding it as an input to d. We can draw this as a computation graph. Each node in the computation graph represents an intermediate value in our computation, and the incoming arrow points to the value it was derived from, and the outgoing arrow points to the value for which it will be the input. Now, because we've described our function purely as a composition of modules, we can work out the derivative purely by repeatedly applying the chain rule. If we fill in this definition of f that we had earlier, then applying the chain rule to the outermost element looks like this. This numerator here represents the function f applied to x, and if we are looking for the derivative of f with respect to x, we can simply take the derivative of d with respect to its input c and multiply it by the derivative of that c with respect to x. Now since we have this computation graph, we know for each module what its input is. And that means that we can take all of these brackets and leave them out, which reduces our chain rule to this. The derivative of f with respect to x is the derivative of d with respect to c times the derivative of c with respect to x. We can then look at this factor here, the derivative of c with respect to x, and break that up again using the intermediate value b. The derivative of c with respect to x is the derivative of c with respect to b times the derivative of b with respect to x. And this final factor here, we can break up again using the intermediate value a, 
the derivative of b with respect to x, is the derivative of b with respect to a, times the derivative of a with respect to x. And that gives us this very neat decomposition of the derivative that we're interested in, of f with respect to its input. This is the basic principle of backpropagation. Using the chain rule, if we describe our function as a chain of computations, then using the chain rule, we can decompose its derivative into the product of many smaller derivatives. We call the derivative that we're ultimately interested in the global derivative, and we call these factors in the decomposed version the local derivatives. The next step is to look at all these four local derivatives that we have and to work them out symbolically. This is simply applying the basic rules of derivative taking that we know, but applying them only to the module. So for instance, when we take the derivative of d with respect to c for this factor over here, we get this derivative. Note that we don't fill in the value of c, we keep it as is because it's the input to this particular module over here, and the derivative with respect to c is all we were asked to work out. Next up is the derivative for module c, which is the sine of b, so its derivative is the cosine of b. And then we get the derivative of module b over its input a, which is e to the power of a, which is famously its own derivative. And finally, we have the derivative of a with respect to x, which is the derivative of minus x, which is minus 1. So here, we have an expression of the derivative that we're interested in using the local derivatives of our modules. Normally, if we were working out the derivative purely symbolically, we might fill in the values of c, b, and a, and see if we can simplify this function. But this is where matters get too complex. Once we start filling in these values, the function that represents a neural network becomes too complex to simplify. So this is where we stop our symbolic analysis, and we switch to numeric computation. We start to work out what this expression means for an actual specific input. For instance, imagine that we get the input x equals minus 4.499. The first thing we need to do is compute a forward pass. This is a fancy name for simply computing the output of the model for a particular input. We do this simply by following the computation graph. The input is fed to the first module, giving us an output a, which we feed to the second module, and so on. During our computation, we retain our intermediate values a, b, c, and d because these will be useful later on. Next up is the backward pass. We take the chain rule derived form of the derivative and we fill in the intermediate values a, b, c, and d. This gives us a function with no variables so we can compute the output. The result is that the derivative of this function for the specific input minus 4.499 is zero. Note that we have stopped doing symbolic computations. We have filled in numeric values and we are working out a numeric result. That is the basic idea of backpropagation. Next, let's see what this looks like for our neural network. Ultimately, what we're interested in is the derivative of the loss with respect to one of our parameters. We'll look at this parameter v2 as a first example. The two computations that are relevant for this example are the computation of the loss, which takes the output of the network y, subtracts the target value t, and squares it, and the computation of the output of the network y as a linear combination of the values h1, h2, h3, and the bias. Looking at this computation, we see that if we apply the chain rule, we can break the derivative of the loss with respect to v2 up into the derivative of the loss with respect to y times the derivative of y with respect to v2. These we can work out symbolically. The derivative of the loss with respect to y we can work out as 2 times y minus t. And the derivative of y with respect to v2 leaves just one term h2. And with this expression in hand, we can simply compute a forward pass for the neural network, retain all the values we need, namely the value of h2 and the value of y and t, and numerically work out the derivative that we would need to apply gradient descent to this parameter. If we do so, the gradient update would look like this. The new value of v2 is the alt value minus this gradient that we've just worked out multiplied by the learning rate. So, so long as we remember the values y, t, and h2, 
we can apply this rule to update our parameter v2. Earlier on in the network, we find the parameter w12. To work out the derivative of the loss with respect to this parameter, there are four modules, four computations that are relevant. As before, the computation of the loss and the computation of the output of the network, then the activation of the second hidden unit, and the computation of the unactivated value of the second hidden unit. Applying the chain rule, we can take this chain of four computations and decompose it into the product of four local derivatives, which we can then each individually work out. The first we already worked out in the previous slide. Second is the derivative of y with respect to h2, which leaves just the factor v2. Then comes the derivative of the output of the logistic sigmoid with respect to its input, which as we've seen before, is the output of the logistic sigmoid times one minus the output of the logistic sigmoid. And finally, the derivative of h2 prime with respect to the parameter w12 is just the corresponding factor x1. And with that, we have an expression for the derivative of w12 in terms of its local derivatives, which gives us this gradient descent update rule. So long as we remember y, t, v2, h2, and x1 during our forward pass, we can fill those in, compute this quantity, and subtract it from our current value of the parameter w12 to do one step of gradient descent. So this approach by itself gives us a way to work out all the derivatives we need, one for each parameter. But note that we are often recomputing the same quantity multiple times. For instance, the error term highlighted here appears in every update rule we compute. This is no coincidence. Because of the graph structure of our computation, the same local derivatives will show up in the expressions of many of our global derivatives. We can make clever use of this to compute all gradients efficiently. That is the final ingredient for backpropagation, and we will discuss this in the next part of the lecture.